Hi, this is Jen Rubin, and this is Jen Rubin's Green Room. There's a lot to talk about. We have a tragic accident in Baltimore in which a tanker hit the bridge, and they are still looking for survivors. And we had possibly another wreck, which was at the Supreme Court. Now, on this one, I'm much more optimistic. The Supreme Court heard the case on the FDA's approval of mifepristone, which is the abortion drug. This, of course, was allowed to be used, was approved for use 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. Uh, And it was really made available uh, and recently made more available uh, for over-the-counter use and wider distribution. Well, the Supreme Court heard a challenge today um, by groups of doctors and other advocates. And the first issue was, do they even have the right to be there? What is their standing? What injury have they sustained? And this used to be a bugaboo of conservatives. Once upon a time, they used to say, well, someone has to have standing. They have to have a real case because otherwise you just have advocates bringing theoretical cases all over the place. And suddenly the judges are not in the business of judging, but simply opining on laws right and left. Well, that's exactly what the conservatives are doing here. And interestingly enough, they run ran into a buzzsaw. You saw a lot of the justices, including conservative justices, say, wait a minute, there are these doctors who don't like an abortion drug? They don't have to use it. That's right, they don't. There's no one who is compelling them to use this drug or perform abortions, because even in the context of federal uh, abortions that are provided in states that still allow abortions, there's a conscience clause. No doctor, no medical personnel need be forced to perform abortion, medical or otherwise. So why are they even there? Well, the argument went on for some time, and I have to say I was pleasantly surprised because only Justice Alito and Justice Thomas seemed to be on the other side. And what they had to say was frankly frightening. They want to revive the so-called Comstock Act. This was used to prevent prostitution uh, across state lines, the transfer of women and materials of a sexual nature across state lines. They want to use that, frankly, to ban abortion and to ban medical abortions, which are uh, made possible through this drug and another abortion drug. Well, that sounds pretty scary. And what's worse, if an administration like a future Trump administration took that position, they wouldn't need Congress to pass any laws. The Comstock Act is on the books. So what these two justices are doing is fishing for a legal theory so that they continue their crusade to ban abortion nationwide. Now, if this sounds inappropriate, if this sounds like it's judicial activists on steroids, yes, it is. And that's what these judges are up against. So in some ways, this argument was incredibly enlightening. On one hand, you saw there's a limit even to what an Amy Coney Barrett, a Justice Kavanaugh, a Justice Neil Gorsuch um, would put up with. On the other hand, you could see how extreme the MAGA anti-abortion, pro-abortion ban forces really are. And that is frightening. They see a whole nother world that is very far from where most Americans are. Abortion is now a 60, 65%, 35% issue, meaning 60 to 65% of Americans want legal access to abortion. So it was eye-opening and somewhat reassuring. Meanwhile, Donald Trump has had uh, quite a spin in New York courts this week. On one hand, he caught a break. The appellate court said he didn't really have to post a bond for $454 million. He could post one just for $175 million. Well, that still sounds like a lot of money, but he may be able to do it. Uh, After all, he's just engineered this IPO of Truth Social. Um, He has made perfectly clear he may seek funds from overseas. He may have foreign governments, foreign banks giving him money. He hasn't ruled that out. So he may very well need to meet uh, the requirements of the bond um, for $175 million, and he may be able to do it. I don't put that past him. 
Now, what does this really mean? I think it means that while the judgment that Trump did, in fact, inflate the values of his various properties will stand up, the amount of damages may not. And at the time of the judgment, some people, even people who are not favorably disposed to Donald Trump, recognized that the monetary amount um, could be excessive. So he's not out of the woods yet. And what's more, the appellate court did something very important. It decided that the appeal would be heard very quickly in July. I know that doesn't sound very quickly, but in terms of the New York appellate courts, that's lightning fast. So they may on one hand be saying, well, we're not going to uphold the whole judgment. On the other hand, they may be saying, we're going to get this done fast and we're going to get to a final judgment and the state of New York is going to be able to enforce it perhaps sooner than Donald Trump imagined. So mixed news there. Meanwhile, this is fast becoming my favorite Trump case, and that is the business falsification case, business records falsification case in New York, brought by Alvin Bragg, who took all kinds of guff from commentators who said, oh, this is a picayune case, or he shouldn't bring it, or it's preempted by federal law. This one is the one that's going to get to trial first, and it may be the most rock solid case of all of them. So this week, Donald Trump um, and his lawyers trooped into court. And what was their claim? That the Southern District of New York, these are federal prosecutors who were supposed to turn over a bunch of documents because remember, they had investigated Trump. They had investigated Michael Cohen. They were supposed to turn over documents months and months ago. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, they dumped tens of thousands of documents. And so Trump was, of course, complaining this is misconduct. We have to delay the trial. Maybe we have to never have a trial. I've been prejudiced. And Merchand basically sat there, scratched his head and say, I don't know why we're here. This DA, Alvin Bragg, has done everything he could possibly have done. As soon as he got the documents, he turned them over. We've given you a few extra weeks to go forward with this. So what's the problem? And in fact, lickety split, he came back with a ruling, which was, I'll see you in court on April 15. At that point, Champ's attorney raised the possibility of yet another kind of frivolous appeal. And Mershon said in reply to that, well, that's fine, but I'll see you on the 15th. Meaning, I don't think I'm going to entertain any more of your nonsense uh, claims and nonsense uh, requests for delay. So think about this. In less than three weeks, Trump is going to have to sit day after day in a New York courtroom with a New York jury and face the music. Finally, he is going to face criminal charges, which, if convicted, are serious felonies. These carry jail time. Now, he may not get a very long jail time. He may not get jail time at all. But the possibility that he could be incarcerated must really terrorize him. And I think that's why you've seen such a absolute volcanic eruption from him on, so, on Truth Social. So he's uh, naturally a bit worried. One last thing I will leave you with, and that is President Biden is running a pretty good campaign. After all of this hysterical screaming and agony about the polls, it turns out he's really up in a fair number of national polls now, not by a lot, kind of tied or one point above. He's improving his standing in state polls. And what's more, he's actually out there energetically campaigning. Where is Trump? He's either in a courtroom or hiding out in Mar-a-Lago. Is something wrong with him? Is he ill? Is he too old? Is he too enfeebled? You know, for all the attacks on our president, he's quite fit. He's quite energetic. He's out there a lot. He's talking to people. He's answering questions in the press. He gave a press conference today on the Baltimore tragedy and took a few questions. So who's the one who's the old man here, the infirmed one, the one who cannot get out an intelligible sentence? I think that might be Donald Trump. So we will see. So a busy week and still more to come. I know you have thought as you have listened to Trump or seen him or read excerpts of his rants, this guy is nuts. And you don't mean it in the colloquial sense. Yes, he's 
erratic, he's absurd, he's a liar, but you also notice there is something deeply wrong with him. There is deeply troubling signs that his brain is not functioning as it should be. You know when you've seen it, he goes off into space. He gets caught in the middle of the sentence. He makes up words. He slurs his speech together. He confuses people. I'm not talking mixing up names. I'm talking confusing people like he did when he said Nikki Haley was responsible for security at the Capitol on January 6th. By the way, Nancy Pelosi wasn't responsible either, but that's who he meant. Now, What do you do with this sense that there is something deeply wrong with him? And even worse, that the press just ignores it. How many articles, how many stories have we seen on Joe Biden's age? Yes, we know he's old, but we've also seen him functioning very well for three plus years. We've seen a State of the Union dress that was really magnificent. We've seen him out campaigning. He talks in detail about policy. He is lucid. There is one thing Trump is not, and that is lucid. So why aren't we hearing more about it? Part of it is an aversion to talking about candidates in medical terms, but part of it is, I think, a hangover from a 1964 campaign in which a bunch of psychiatrists, psychologists got together and they basically said that Barry Goldwater was crazy. They hadn't examined him. And what they really meant was that his ideas were crazy. And after that, the psychiatric profession got together and they decided we're not going to do that anymore. You can't be diagnosing people who you don't see. And that has kept not only certain medical professionals, but I think the press far away from a topic. That's okay in the normal circumstance. But what happens if you have a candidate who is actually nuts, who is actually, as they would say, certifiable? Where can the public go to get some insight into what's really going on? How this is a debilitating situation for him, if it is. And what's the difference between the normal process of aging and something else, and that something else is deeply troubling? Well, I've got the perfect guest. Unfortunately, he has not been interviewed by mainstream outlets. He has gotten some interview space on outlets like Salon, but he is a practicing psychologist. He is renowned in his field, and he has banded together with a group of other mental health professionals to warn us and to inform us about their observations of Donald Trump. And that's what this show is going to be about. So I am delighted to walk, welcome to the show Dr. John Gartner. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I've been a longtime reader of your column. Well, thank you very much. I have become fascinated by your work. For the listeners who are not familiar with us, tell us a little bit about your professional background. Okay, well, so I taught at Johns Hopkins University Medical School in the Department of Psychiatry part-time for 28 years. Um, I am mostly in private practice uh, as a psychologist um, and really became involved in this movement, you know, when I wasn't involved in politics until Trump hit the scene and changed all of our lives. And really sort of as a citizen, uh, I felt I had to step forward. Um, And as a psychologist, I felt like we had special knowledge. In my case, I was trained in personality disorders from an expert named Otto Kernberg, who's famous in our field. So I was very familiar with the criteria for malignant narcissism. And when Trump came on the scene, it was obvious to me that this was someone who fit the criteria for a disorder that was literally retrofitted to explain Hitler by Eric Fromm, the famous psychoanalyst who had to flee Nazi Germany. He literally tried to put together a personality type that would explain the personality of Hitler. So when I saw he ticked all the boxes, I suddenly became an activist. But then actually, I retired from politics a year ago. Um, (laughs) There was a pinned tweet to the top of our duty to warn account that said, I'm retiring. I don't know if you can have a retirement tweet, but (laughs) but I did. And And now um, you're back. 
and now and you're I'm back. back. And, 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 and it's for a very specific reason, and it's very reluctantly, believe me. I'm in the process of selling a book. <laughs> I'm working on a book about psilocybin therapy, which I think is going to change our field. It's called The Cosmic Consciousness Cure. My agent likes the book. He just wants me to make changes to the proposal. Believe me, this is not a time in my life to get interrupt my, my, my real work. Uh, but I saw that... Sorry, go ahead. You going to say something? Yeah. Um, as I said in the intro to the show, there was a rule that developed in among medical doctors called the Goldwater mm -hmm. Rule. Right. And that came out of a situation in which medical doctors weren't actually observing behavior of the candidate. They, in essence, took his views and his speeches and said, in essence, this is nuts and did that. True. What you are doing and what other psychiatrists are doing is very, very different. It has nothing to do with his policy views. It has to do with what you have observed. And one of the complaints about the Goldwater rule is you cannot diagnose someone without meeting them. Well, in your case, rather than a half hour interview, you've had hundreds and yes. hundreds of hours. Exactly. So talk a little bit about the ability to evaluate someone, perhaps not in person, but nevertheless, with probably more information that you would have about right. any patient exactly. beginning mm -hmm. a course yeah. of therapy. Talk to us a little bit about that. I, mean, well, I did write an article in the British Journal of Psychiatry about the Goldwater Rule. I'm just referencing it if people want to look it up in more detail, uh, my position. But basically, I actually interviewed the last living member of the first ethics committee of the American Psychiatric Association, a man who wrote the Goldwater Rule. His name is Alan Dyer, and he's still with us. And he told me that today he would not write the Goldwater Rule. For two reasons. One, he thinks it's been used in a bad way as a gag order to prevent mental health professionals from coming forward in the case of Trump. But also, people don't understand the historic origins of the Goldwater Rule. It's actually, a little, if I can just give you a little bit of background. Yes. In 1964, a magazine called Fact Magazine published an article saying, a thousand psychiatrists think Goldwater is crazy or something. I forgot the exact title. And, and um, Goldwater sued them. And he won $75,000 <laughs> in 1964. Wow. Um, but he was actually deserved to win because um, what they did was, first of all, the magazine was uh, dishonest in the way they reported their findings. One thing, they picked the most inflammatory quotes you know, to, to put in their article. But also, this was before we had the DSM. I'll, I'll explain the DSM in a minute. But these were, um, this was in the era of psychoanalysis when people were making kind of somewhat wildly speculative uh, comments about Barry Goldberg. They're saying he was a, a latent homosexual, or he had been scarred by his potty training. These are real quotes. Um, or he, you know, he, he hated his mother. Um, so it was kind of wild analysis. And what really upset the people on the committee is there was no basis for these, uh, these uh, valid basis for these statements. And so it embarrassed psychiatry. What Alan Dyer and I will tell you is that everything changed in our field in 1980. When we, we adopted Robert Spitzer's DSM-3, and the difference is it had observable behavioral criteria for every single disorder. So that means if you can observe behavior, you can diagnose. Now, that doesn't mean you should, but those are two different questions. I want to make a very clear line between whether I'm being unethical by informing you that Donald Trump is showing serious time signs of dementia or whether I'm being inaccurate. I would argue I'm being ethical, both because the Goldwater Rule is anachronistic in the way I explained, but also if we've learned nothing from the Holocaust, it's this. It's always less, eth less ethical to say nothing. So that's right. my view on the ethics. But Got on it. the science of it, we now use behavioral criteria. Well, as you pointed out, I've observed more hours of behavior of Donald Trump than perhaps my entire practice put together. So if I have the valid basis for forming a diagnosis. And actually, research shows the psychiatry interview is not even the gold standard. It's less accurate. Because it's self-reporting. Right. right. It's self-reporting. Self yeah, exactly. Yes. Now, 
if you actually had him as a patient, you might do other things like take a brain scan to see if he had a, a brain tumor, for example, or take a look at his other medications to see whether this was a result of some uh, poor combination or poor management mm -hmm. of prescription medication. So we'll put that aside for a moment. That would be certainly part of a physical or a, you know, a, mm -hmm. an in-present um, evaluation. But Given what you have, what you are seeing, explain how you have seen something that is different than the mere process of aging. Because we're getting into this really bad equivalence where people yeah. say, well, Biden's old, right. Trump's old, they're both old. So explain qualitatively what's right. the difference between a broken brain and an aging mm -hmm. brain. Very well put. I really honestly feel that America is being gaslit. Um, and they're really, America's really being told two lies. I think they're pathologizing Biden's normal aging, and they're normalizing Trump's very serious signs of dementia. Uh, there, there's a, a huge difference. There's this false kind of two old men narrative or old Biden narrative that doesn't even, that somehow makes Trump look stronger in some way. And it's actually literally the opposite of reality. And so this is very frustrating to me. And that's why I came back from retirement, because nobody with the right letters after their name was correcting this record. And it matters. It matters a lot to the future of the country. People need to know before they vote if the person they're voting for has a serious dementia. I mean, at this phase, I believe that Donald Trump is not just unfit. Right? That was my mission for five years, to tell people Donald Trump is unfit. Well, I think we know that now. Now I'm here to say he's incapable. He cannot cognitively understand the job of president. I don't think he could cognitively understand any complex job at this point. If he weren't in this unique political position, I think his relatives would be not only bringing him to experts for evaluation, but maybe even considering some kind of care. Uh, you, you asked about the difference. You know, I'm not an expert in this field, let me say that, but I've interviewed now 20 or 30 experts in this field. And we have comments from experts, we have from our petition, people who are saying, I'm a neuropsychologist, I'm a neuropsychiatrist, I'm a gerontologist, I'm a gerontological nurse. I've done this for 30 years. I know it when I see it, and this is it. And to be more, and they also give the clinical criteria. They explain, here's the diagnostic criteria, here's what I'm observing, here are the examples. So if you like, I can explain, you know, let me break some yes, of that down. Yeah. Because I, it, it's, look, so what Biden is doing, right, forgetting names, right? You're about my age. Talk to anyone our age, right? And we start talking among ourselves. Yes. <laughs> and, and the issue of memory will often come up. I can't believe my memory. Oh, my gosh. You know, um, uh, just yesterday, I was talking to my daughter. And I said, Oh, mom tells me you're going to Barcelona. She's doing a semester abroad in Paris for the weekend. That sounds great. She looks at me with this like disgusted face like dad, I told you that two weeks ago. It's like, oh, yeah, right. And, <laughs> and like, and remember, oh, well, now I can be remember, excited all over again. <laughs> exactly. And remember that guy, what's his name? What's his name? Yeah, I, yeah we, we right. do that. That's, uh, and, and even, where did I put my keys? Oh, they're in my pocket. You know, those uh, sorts yeah. of small lapses are right. just the normal process of your brain aging. Aging. And I would suggest that it doesn't mean that you're less competent. I believe I'm at the top of my game. I'd rather right. be in therapy with the John Gartner of 2024 than the John Gartner of 2004 or 2014. I mean, he didn't know anything. I didn't even know how right. he helped anybody. I don't know why anyone paid <laughs> <read> him. <laughs> right. And that's because with aging comes experience and something we call judgment um, that is based upon the accumulated experiences of having seen a thing or two along the way. So that's the plus and the minus of getting older. But you are seeing something very different, and your colleagues are seeing something very different right. when they see Trump. What right. are they seeing? Right. So let, so let me break it down. First of all, before you can even consider a diagnosis of something like dementia, you really need to see a precipitous decline from someone's baseline. So we always have to start from the patient's own baseline. Well, if you look at videotapes of Donald Trump speaking you know, in the 1980s, um, he had a sophisticated vocabulary. He spoke not only in complete sentences, but polished paragraphs. Now his vocabulary is impoverished and he can barely finish a sentence. Sometimes he can't finish a word. Sometimes he doesn't use words at all. He just uses sounds, whoosh, boom. 
you know, like a like a toddler. Okay, so this is a dramatic decline, you know, from his Ivy League brain <clears throat> to um, you know not being able to form simple English words. And when we start to see this deterioration, at some point it's going to accelerate. Um, so it's not going to move at this pace. We're already seeing it pick up, but we, you know, it's there's a cliff that people tend to fall off of at a certain point. And so we don't know how close he is to the cliff. But imagine if someone was president and he fell off the cliff, and he really yeah. could not, didn't know where he was. I so there's a number of areas. One of them is memory. Okay, I just want to say something and have everyone just take, if they don't mind, one breath and take in what I'm about to say. This one observation about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is a candidate for president who doesn't know who the current president of the United States is. Eight times he said that it's Obama. He wasn't joking. He didn't look like he was joking. He never jokes. He only says he's joking when he feels he has to backtrack on something outrageous. If he said it eight times on camera, how often, how many times a day does he think Obama is president? You see what I mean? That's what we've seen in the public domain. Well, one of the things that we see in dementia, right? is not forgetting your keys. It's forgetting people and combining people, okay? And combining generations. So when he was talking about, uh, you know, Nikki Haley and describing her as if she was Nancy Pelosi, it's classic dementia. That's nobody, you know, that's not a mistake people make who don't have severely damaged brains. And it's usually dementia. Um, you know, he said that his father was born in Germany when it's his grandfather that was born in Germany. You know, my uncle, uh, Bruce, had dementia, and right before they brought him to the memory care you know, home center, he was screaming, he was agitated. He said, somebody call John. He'll know what to do. He's a lawyer. My dad was a lawyer, you know. So he was confusing generations. And, 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 but the point is, he was on the verge of being brought to a memory care center for care. Um, so, you know, it's the fact that he is mixing up people mashing them up together, okay, is, is really huge. It's really huge. Um, you know, he, he, so he thinks he's running against Obama and uh, the Nancy Pelosi, you know. <laughs> right. But seriously, that level of cognitive breakdown, right, you know, just as, from, you know, from, from one sense, just from common sense, right, from any of us who've had a, a relative who's had dementia or a friend or who's gone through it with somebody, right, we recognize that as a sign when somebody's really losing it. You know, not right. where are my keys, but like they, they really need care. Um, and, and so I think that's one of the things that's really being sort of, you know, glossed over. Um, I've even been told that, you know, he sometimes doesn't recognize people that he's, you know, known for, you know, for, for a long time. So, right. um, so, so he that's mis the identified, He misidentified um, people when he thought a picture of E. Jean Carroll was actually his second Correct. wife. That Another was a example. photograph in front of him, and he either couldn't tell the difference or got confused. That was in a deposition. So we have seen right. that, exactly what you're talking about. So this is serious. Absolutely. Um, talk to us about some of the other verbal yes. things that we yeah. see. So the other main we, area is language. Um, and so wh one of the things that we see, there are some of the things that he's evidencing that Again, I've talked to people who've done this all their lives and had spent hours talking to them that this is absolutely a sign of organic brain damage. That nobody without brain damage does this. Phonemic aphasias. He's now doing them. It's it's using a non-word in place of a word, but it has a, a like a stem of the real word. So, like when he wanted to say Michels, he says Mishes, or Christmas is Christmas. It's like he can't finish the word, so he just kind of gets out of the word with an easy sound. Okay. He, there are supercuts, you know, on Twitter and on the comedy shows, you know, of 30 or 40 examples of this. Okay. And I, I asked several experts, does anybody without brain damage ever do this? And they all told me no. <laughs> he also shows another kind of aphasia called a semantic aphasia, where, he where semantic aphasia is using words that are real words, but using them for the wrong meaning, like saying the oranges of the investigation is sort of the classic, uh, you know, example. So he's showing those kinds of breakdowns. And then finally, he's showing a breakdown to the point where he's even using non-words. He's just using sounds, you know, the whoosh boom that I was uh, talking about. The other thing that he does is he becomes tangential and starts to sort of link unrelated thought fragments in a way that doesn't make any sense, um, that is not actually comprehensible, that people cannot 
could not decode or understand what he is saying because it's almost a word salad. It's sort of a com combination of like, this made me think of that, and that made me think of this, and maybe it's all together. And sometimes they, they do something called confabulation, where they tell a story about the different fragments that came up to try to tie it together. You know, he's talking about like, uh, you know, Snake Mountain, Snake Hill, and oh, they got a oh, Snake Mountain, they got a lot of snakes there. Oh, they got so many snakes. So he just kind of bounces off of it. But he's doing it all the time, and he's doing it more often. Now, one of the other things I've noticed is that when he gets into one of these verbal cul-de-sacs, his body language changes, his demeanor yes. changes. What is that about? I'm so glad you mentioned that um, because when I was working on this, I started to really get into this tape and really analyze it. And you're absolutely right. His whole demeanor changes at those moments. His face goes blank. It goes blank. Uh, he sometimes just stops talking. He sometimes stares at the, at the ceiling or over here. And it, you can tell that the, 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 the system is just shut down. And then it sort of reboots <laughs> and he <laughs> starts talking again. But a lot of times when he, when he reboots, he, doesn't, he can't really orient himself. So like, for example, uh, and here's an example of a semantic aphasia. Um, he was talking, I forget which city this was in. He was saying, we're going to protect God-loving. And then he stares at the ceiling. Context and content. Yeah. Right. So it's, he gets caught um, and he has to figure out where he is kind of in the flow of things. Um, when you say dementia, um, is that the same as Alzheimer's? Is there a cluster Alzheimer's is a of form of dementia. Of dementia. But, uh, yeah, but there could be yeah. other forms of dementia. Yes, yes. But, a lot of people are saying frontotemporal dementia, you know, so um, uh, because of some of, the, uh, some of the experts I talk to. Um, but they're all forms of dementia. And it's probably because of his family history of Alzheimer's, that would be probably the most likely. Um, but, you know, all of the people that I talked to said, yeah, of course, if you were my patient, I would definitely have a brain scan. I would definitely send him for a neuropsych, you know, evaluation. But Donald Trump's not going to do that. Right. You know, he's not going to oblige us by going for those evaluations and sharing the results with them. Of course, that's what a doctor would want to do. So what we have is what we have. <laughs> and right. we have to learn how to decode or make sense of or know how to interpret what we're seeing. And so look, for the average person, they might just think it's a flub or a, you know, a gaff and, you know, but people who have been doing this for a living are telling me, no, these are telltale signs, right? These are, you know, sine qua non. These are, you know, sort of proof. Uh, these are things that that are are, are specific to this disorder <laughs> um, that, that tell us and, that it's not medication. Right. And these are, this is not a reversible condition, is it? Um, you no, don't unfortunately, get better. No. You don't recover from it. You also don't stay the same. You deteriorate. And I think that's something people really have to get their minds. As bad as you think Donald Trump is, you're seeing the best Donald Trump you're ever going to see. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> you know, and I mean, it, it is interesting that people who work with him just three years ago will say he's not the same Donald Trump he was in 2000. That's a relatively short period of time. That's if right. Your otherwise healthy uncle is 81 as opposed to 77, you might not have noticed much difference. Maybe he's different than he was when he was 60. But mm -hmm. in that short period of time, it yeah. may be almost imperceptible. These people are saying they've seen a dramatic decline in a short period of time. That's that such an excellent point, because if we're going to try to map the curve of when Donald Trump will so fall off the cliff that he is truly um, like incontinent, right. <laughs> you know, um, uh, the rap the the rapid rate of decline and the accelerating rate of decline is we're looking at a rock rolling downhill. Wow, wow! So it's very interesting. I've written about this um, some, as you've noted. Um, you don't see this on the New York Times. You don't see this, um, you know, on the news section of my paper. You don't see this on CNN. What? do reporters or your colleagues who talk to reporters tell you about the reticence to cover this and even to make a fact known that you have a petition with several hundred 
very well-established mental health professionals who are identifying in some detail what they have observed. Why is this? Well, you know, may maybe as someone who's in the field, you can help me understand because it's the great mystery that, I, that I've that i been contemplating for uh, quite some while now. Right. You know, I don't want to be cynical, but I, I, I do notice that, you know, right-wing billionaires are buying up all the media. Yeah. Uh, and I think that some of this really is that they, the writers are afraid of the corporate taskmasters. You know, this is, and, and, and really, we're creating a sort of a, in our society in general, a culture of fear, you know, where people are afraid to step out of line, you know, so it's not just the media, it's also the doctors. I mean, you know, one of the things I say about this petition is, you know, these are not partisan crisis actors. Okay. I don't know how many doctors you've known, but the, most of the doctors I know are pretty risk averse, okay? yes. especially when it comes to their reputations. They don't go risking their reputations lightly. Everyone who signed this petition signed with their name on the record in public view. Uh, and they took a considerable professional and personal risk to do that. I know that because I had dozens of people who I'm close to who begged off signing the petitions because they cited credible evidence of their fear of professional or personal retaliation. So these are medical whistleblowers, really. And I think they're kind of heroes, but they're taking a risk and people don't like to take risks, right? That's what we learned from the Holocaust. Say nothing. It's safer. So there's a version on the part of medical professionals. There's a version on the point of writers. There's a version on the part of editors. There's an aversion upon among lawyers who work for these outlets. So it's perhaps is explainable that we do not have a surplus of uh, information on this. Tell us a little bit about the uh, petition. We're going to put a link to it in the show notes. Right. And um, okay. we would love to, if you could provide the link, to have the verbiage because it's very yes, compelling. In, in individuals, um, it's not a cookie cutter thing, everyone's saying the same thing and just signing their name. They're talking about what they're seeing, what their specific background is, how that comports. Tell us a little bit about the types of people who have signed on and how many people you have at this point. And also, if you're a medical professional out there and would like to sign on, how do they do that? Okay, so the petitions on change.org, uh, uh, I think it's the title, uh, our diagnostic impression of Donald Trump is probable dementia. Um, and uh, I, I'm glad you so glad you mentioned the comments, because what I always say to people is the number of signatures is important. But I think what the signers had to say is much more convincing. Uh, and the, the pinned tweet to duty to warn on Twitter um, is the only place you can read a complete collection of all those quotes. I add to it every day. There's about 26 quotes now in the string. Um, and really, it's more compelling to hear people in their own words say, you know, um, one woman is a psychiatrist who specializes in frontotemporal dementia. She wrote a page and a half. It looks like a medical report. Uh, you know, Elizabeth Zoffman is her name. Uh, she wrote a whole, she wrote a whole uh, kind of a medical evaluation. And then I have people, you know, writing things like, I've been a gerontologist for 30 years. You know, uh, I'm a neuropsychiatrist at a, an academic medical center, you know, in a movement clinic. I evaluate patients like this every day. I believe that he has dementia because of blah, 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 the things I've been talking about. Of course, I'd you know, want to get a definitive diagnosis. I'd want to get a brain scan. But in other words, when you really hear medical people explaining it as they would explain it to a peer or a patient, you know, the medical reasoning, you start to realize these people aren't fakers. I mean, these people, mm -hmm. what the petition did was give them a platform or a voice to say what they've been screaming at the television. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? There was right. no way for any of us to speak out. And so I'm really here, not just to hear from John Gartner again, was the world's had enough of that. But I'm here representing the near 500 medical professionals who signed that petition. So 500. And it's, we're I almost assume, up to 500. Right. And um, I assume that you check these people out. You just don't set, you know. I ended up you know, eliminating Donald two thirds of, yeah, yeah, two -thirds of the signatures. Doctor, right. you know, is it takes not me someone hours. you're going to put up. 
it takes me hours uh, 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 checking all these uh, signatures, uh, and I'm a few hundred behind because they, they're going up faster and faster. I'm just one guy. But basically, yeah. if you're ever wondering, it's about a third of the signatures that are valid. That's the number that keeps coming up. So wow. people see online that there's 1,500 signatures right now. There's about 500 real ones. So if you're ever wondering how many real ones we have, just divide by three you can, or call Got it. it. <laughs> Got it. And if you're a medical professional out there, you're a specialist in any of these fields, um, how do they get onto the petition? How do they uh, find it? Do they just go on change.org? Do they have to email you first? How do they, uh, no, how does no, it work? Let's go to change.org. Yeah, you could just Google it, uh, you know, just put it in Google. And so people can, you know, join it. Yeah, it's searchable. Um, they'll find it. Do you have a strategy, given the fact that mainstream media outlets are not exactly cooperating mm -hmm. with the job of educating the public. By the way, very, very smart professor at NYU who's a journalism professor says, ah, Jennifer, you're confused. You think the job of the mainstream media is to produce educated voters. No, their job is to get clicks and to make money. Mm -hmm. And that may in large part explain why um, they've not been so receptive. What do you think is the best yeah. way to let the public know? Would you make a film? Would you go on a lecture circuit? What, if anything, um, are you thinking of doing so that people understand this? Well, actually, my, my latest idea, and I'll see if it works, but there are some softwares available where you can actually run um, verbal speech through them, and they'll give you some analysis as to whether the person is showing signs of dementia. Um, I'm actually going to be talking to the person who developed the software Thursday. I'm afraid when I tell him what I want to use it for, he might not give me permission. So I don't want to promise wow. I'm doing the study. But I guess what I'm trying to do is find ways to bring the truth to America's wow. attention. Okay. Wow. You know, that's such a hard thing to do nowadays, right? The truth right. has become so, we've become so gaslit, you know, the narratives have become so um, controlled. Okay. It's a really, really hard for the truth to break through. Um, right. And so I am, I'm determined, I'm determined that the truth will break through. Um, and so um, I'm going to get America's attention <laughs> for this right. issue or die trying. <laughs> right. But, well, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, you're probably, you, I'm sure your uh, patients need you out there. So um, if you are um, interviewing a yeah. non-professional, let's say somebody who worked in the White House, who saw him very frequently, who sees him now, what are the kinds of questions you would want to ask that person to get at the truth? In other words, the mainstream media is interviewing these people, just not about this subject, but they yeah. actually have remarkably relevant information. It's like interviewing a family member to get yeah. the truth Absolutely. of what's going on inside the home because they see these people every day. What are the kinds of things that you would be asking these people yeah. um, to help flesh out the picture yeah. you are getting of him? What information might they have? Well, you put it very well. It is like interviewing a family member. And actually, when we talked about the Goldwater rule, informant interviews are more valid than interviews of patients. <laughs> in other words, yes. if I talk to 10 people who know Jennifer Rubin, I might know get her number better than that. <laughs> yes, um, yes, we're, we're always not honest about ourselves. This is true. Yes, this is true. So, so, so uh, you know, um, uh, I think that we would ask for signs of deterioration in the air. Actually, I didn't finish the checklist uh, in the areas we've covered, but the other areas, by the way, are behavior and movement. So behavior would be things like becoming more impulsive, um, uh, showing poorer judgment, becoming more paranoid, becoming more confused, becoming more disoriented. So I would ask them if they were seeing more of those behaviors. And of course, we are already hearing that they are. And by the way, the last area, and this is the one I knew the least about, but actually to me in some ways is the most interesting, is motor behavior. Um, yes. You know, because there are some telltale signs that a, that a neurologist sees that a normal person doesn't see. For example, he has something called a wide-based gait, uh, where he kind of swings his right leg around like it's a dead weight, and he kind of swings it around in a semicircle. Uh, I'm kind of exaggerating the, the description yep. of the movement, just so. But now that I say it, you'll probably start to see it. 
Um, that's called a wide base gait, and it is something that happens to people's motor performance when they start going through dementia. The other things are difficulties with fine motor coordination. We've noticed the difficulty as drinking a glass of water or a bottle of water, um, difficulty walking uh, down a, a ramp. Um, the other things are kind of a, a weird posture he has where he kind of leans forward. Um, right, at the waist. Yeah. yeah, at the waist. That's yeah. actually considered a sign of frontotemporal dementia. Um, and the, another thing he does that I never even noticed, but one neurologist brought it up is sometimes he puts his hands on the table, like the table is trying to levitate and he's trying to hold it down. Uh, I don't even know what that's called. Uh, right. but I mean, these are the kind of sort of, you know, signs and signals, right. Of a particular disorder that an expert would recognize that an ordinary person wouldn't. And that's why it's so important that we have the expert voices, uh, so that people can know how to understand what it is they're seeing. Although to be honest, I think people, if we would just show it to them in the media, you know, it's almost like the emperor's new clothes. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> here he is. I mean, every anybody can see this person is babbling. Only it's like the emperor's new clothes, except if I say he's naked, people will say, how, can you, how do you know he's naked? Have you examined him personally? <laughs> right. <laughs> You're exactly. very unethical to say he's naked. I mean, even when you say the emperor has new clothes, uh, it, it, it's, it's controversial. <laughs> right. And I think inherently, um, news people, anybody who follows him, any citizen, understands that it's not just that he has peculiar views or that he, um, you know, has this enormous ego, but the way he expresses himself, the way he carries himself, there is something very weird and very different. It's as if right. the right. film is on the wrong speed or the focus is yeah. out. There is no one else. Um, and I don't say this as a compliment, who behaves as he does, who yeah, speaks yeah. as he does, that does what he does, which is run for political office. Um, there are many people who say, oh, that person's a nut. But you don't mean that that person is having problems telling whether it's Nancy Pelosi or Nikki Haley, <laughs> who was there at a moment. So he yeah. is um, different. And I think people at least can acknowledge there is something weird going on, and that in and of itself deserves, I think, interest. Um, and, it deserves attention, uh, right? It, it deserves attention. Yes. In other words, you don't have to. I, you don't have to be convinced that I, you know that he has dementia, but we absolutely should be a thousand convinced. We need to ask the question. We're not yes. even asking the question. And, it, exactly. and I, the, the the gaslighting takes place with this euphemistic language that normalizes Trump. So a yes. sample headline, in a rambling speech, Trump attacks immigrants. Okay, right. you know, rambling is when you've smoked too much pot and you're telling a story and you can't remember why you're telling that story. That's rambling, okay? Uh, yes. What he's doing is being unable to form words or sentences or make himself understood using language. That's not yes. rambling. To call it rambling is actually gaslighting. Because yes. it's normalizing something that is severely pathological. Right. Or I've seen headlines, Trump and Biden pre present two different views of America, as if Donald Trump were presenting some kind of political science paper or discussing a sociology book he wrote. He's not capable of presenting right. a vision. There's not an art or he says he argues or he attacks. That language infers a level of logical progression as if he's building yeah. an argument and connecting one thought to another thought. Um, when he simply lashes out or makes up names or makes these word salads that go on, we don't really have a good vocabulary for describing that. And I have to say, because there is a impulse in media not to write four paragraphs of the nonsense words or to put a mm -hmm. tape of two minutes long, which you really have mm -hmm. to see to appreciate, that simply truncating it makes it seem more normal and makes him seem exactly. more on the ball. Yes. Because yeah. you can find a fragment of five words that make <laughs> sense, or you can find, um, you know, a phrase, but you can't cover up for two minutes or for 
three paragraphs, which is what you would have to set out. So I think in some ways it's the limitation of time and space that the media now operates with. If you actually had a debate and you had to give them two minutes to answer a question, it might be devastatingly informative that you would see him what he's like over two minutes. I don't think the average American really does. Um, no, it's, 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 it reminds me of FDR, the way the press kind of covered yes. up his disability. You know, I feel like the press is doing that for Trump's cognitive disability. And yes. some of it, you're right, is just the nature of the form. Like you say, like, if you have to write an article, you're going to use the quotes that make sense. You're not going to think. And then he said, Baba Booba Daba. Okay. Yeah, daba <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> when right. asked for comment, he said, uh, right. But, 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 but actually, that's the most important thing he said. Yeah, exactly. Because we already know all of his BS about whatever crazy stuff, river of blood, we're going to kill all the immigrants, immigrants aren't people. Okay, we know you're evil. We know you're telling us your sinister plan. Okay, right. like the evil people in the, in the movies, right? You're going to take over. You're going to kill everybody. You're going to get revenge. Okay, we get that because that's Donald Trump without dementia. That's Donald Trump. That's who he really is. He's a malignant narcissist. That part is his character, okay? But what we know in psychiatry is that when people have a personality disorder and they get dementia, they become that personality disorder worse times 10. So everything that was bad about their personality gets dramatically worse because of their cognitive uh, uh, decline. So if he's evidencing dementia in his speeches, that's the most important part of the speech. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think to leave our listeners with a explanation. He was an evil Bond villain before, but he was a lucid evil Bond villain. Now he's not lucid, he's still evil, but his brain isn't working. So he's more like the henchman who doesn't really speak. He grunts and, you know, and gestures as opposed to the guy who has the devilishly clever plan that he can spell out, you know, at a moment's notice. Um, John, you are a fascinating individual. You explain this so well. I am very grateful you came on the show. We will include a link to the petition and the comments. Um, and we'll also put in a link to a couple of your interviews. You've done some great ones um, with uh, Salon so that uh, listeners can read that um, or they can listen to that if they will. And My friend Dan um, Rodericks wrote a column today and he was mad that I didn't break the story with him. So I just want to give a shout out to Dan Rodericks. <laughs> and he is with what uh, outlet? Baltimore Sun. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So we will see something in the Baltimore Sun today. We today hope. it came out Three. Drop Excellent. Her. Fabulous. We'll put that in the links as well. Oh, Thank good, you, good. John. Thank you for Thank what you're you. doing. Hopefully we won't have to find out the consequences of electing someone with a broken brain, um, but um, we'll now be better informed, I hope. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And that was John Gartner. Wow, that is frightful. It's frightful on many levels. First of all, because the press refuses to cover a major issue. We're this close to potentially electing someone who is mentally deteriorating before our eyes, who is not going to get better, and who is likely to get worse over time. We are talking about someone who is not simply unfit for office in the moral sense, in the knowledge sense, in the sense of having no self-control, but really lacks the capacity to do the job. And you will understand that he will not really be running things. The crazy pants advisors who he has around him will be pulling the strings and telling him what to do, or they will simply let him run rampant. This guy's going to have nuclear codes. He's going to have decisions involving life and death over our economy, over every aspect of our life. This is the person who people are considering electing. So what do we do? I think we do our best to elevate those professionals who are acting responsibly, carefully observing Donald Trump, analyzing what they see, sharing what they see, and we present this to the public. And Although your network of 
friends and relations, colleagues may not be very large, you think, it's a great place to start. And you can do that by sharing information, sharing the content of the wonderful petition they got together, of the interviews that John Gartner has done, and hopefully this show as well. And I think it will make a difference to people. I think it will reinforce the necessity of not letting this guy get anywhere near the White House. So if you enjoyed the show and you enjoyed our other show, please tell your friends. They can follow us and subscribe at YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever they get their podcasts. Bye-bye.